Hello, this is Pastor Paul Coles from Friendship Baptist Church. I'm so glad to have you with us today. We're continuing in our Bible study from the New Testament book of 1 Peter. So I hope you'll grab your Bible or your Bible app and join me in 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning at verse 12. But in the meantime, I hope you'll take time to join with me in worship through song as Chad and Stephanie Gibson present Bless Your Name. Prisoner's chains, bleeding stripes, Paul and Silas prayed that night, and in their pain began to You've worked hard for your company for the last 10 years, but you just got your layoff notice. Of course, the question you're asking is, why God? Your wife's just informed you that she wants a divorce, and you cry out, why God? The doctor says, I've got bad news. It's cancer and it's terminal. And you cry out again, why God? You're being attacked for taking a biblical stand on a very important biblical issue. And then your condemnation from others, you ask, why God? So what's the problem? Is the problem that God doesn't exist? Or is it that God doesn't know what's about to happen in this particular situation and circumstance? Or maybe that God just doesn't have the power to do anything about it. 
No, none of those things are the problem. You see, if you're a believer, your faith is probably in the fire. It's either been in the fire, it's in the fire, or it's about to go in the fire. And when your faith is in the fire, it's vital that you remember three important things about the fiery trials that you're facing. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, gives us an ideal place to start as we look at these three things. First, I want you to know that fiery trials are a reality. Listen to verse 12 in 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Now, the phrase fiery trial here in verse 12 means an agonizing experience. Have you ever been through an agonizing experience? Sometimes it's one of those things that just kind of comes and goes with very little effect on you. And other times it lingers and it seems like it just zaps every bit of your strength. And then still other times it puts you on the sidelines for a while. A fiery trial that's talked about here in verse 12 is a reminder that suffering can be very intense. New Christians sometimes get confused when they think about what the Christian life is about. Someone really hasn't taught them very well, and so they think that once they get saved, everything goes perfectly from there on out. And there shouldn't be any more difficulties for them as believers. But the reality is, when you put your faith in Christ, there will be, there will be, pressures and there will be persecution. The Bible tells us in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 14 verse 22 it says we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't say uh, if or possibly it's a guarantee. You will. You, Jesus never taught the prosperity gospel. Instead Jesus taught the persecution gospel. Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 teaches us this, Blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then go over to John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 20. Go over there with me and hear these words. Jesus speaking says, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. See, he's trying to get us ready for the fact that this is going to happen. Just as he was telling his disciples this, he's also, by extension, telling us this. Randy Alcorn said something that really caught my attention. A faith that leaves us unprepared for suffering is a false faith that deserves to be lost. He says, he goes on to say, if you base your faith on a lack of affliction, your faith lives on the brink of extinction and will fall apart because of a frightening diagnosis or a shattering phone call. Token faith will not survive suffering, nor should it. Believing God exists is not the same as trusting the God who exists. Well said, Randy Alcorn. Verse 12 goes back to say here in 1 Peter chapter 4, Think it not strange. Now, why, why did he say that? Think it not strange. Because, friends, fiery trials are, again, a reality. Don't be surprised by trials and tribulations. Don't be surprised. It's not absurd or meaningless to go through those things. You may say, well, well why not? Because those things are meant to help you in your growth, in your development, in your journey as a believer in Jesus Christ. Jim Warren, who used to host the program Primetime America on Moody uh, Radio, gave this timeless advice. When hard times come, be a student, not a victim. That's right. Be a student, not a victim. Now, that's wise uh, counsel today because we live in a victim culture, don't we? I don't have to tell you too much about that because we are surrounded by a lot of people who have become experts in playing the blame game. A victim says, why did this happen to me? But a student says, I don't care why it happened. I just want to learn what God is trying to teach me through all of this. I like that attitude. Jesus had that same attitude in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 33, when he said, These things I have spoken to you in that you might have peace. And then he goes on to say, In this world ye shall. He didn't say you might or you could or you should. He said, Ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And guess what? If Jesus overcame the world, he wants you to overcome the world in the power and the perseverance of the attitude that Jesus had. 
How often do we exclaim these words, I can't believe this is happening to me. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 11, we are reminded, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. But you may ask, well, aren't Christians supposed to be fireproof? <laughs> well, I wish that was the case, but I know for a fact that's not. You know what? As human beings, we long for comfort. We long for peace and safety and security. We long for that. And we're ready to do just about anything that it takes if it means we can avoid suffering. Tragically, most churches today are not equipping their members with the understanding that we will face persecution, that we will face tough times in our lives. A false gospel teaches that if you get saved, everything's going to be perfect. And that's called the prosperity gospel, if you will. Uh, others may ask, well, why is God allowing this to happen to me now? It's about the particular timing on the calendar. And the reality is we don't know the answer to that question. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, the Word of God says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you suffered persecution for being a Christian? Have you been lied about or had your words twisted or you've been misrepresented or passed over simply because you were a believer in Jesus Christ? If you've never suffered for your faith, it may be, and I want you to just think about this and pray about this very carefully. If you've never suffered for your faith, it may be because you're not living a godly life that people can see. That's hard words. Those are hard words, aren't they? You see, there's no cheap, easy, or lazy way uh, to serve the Lord by faith. Peter would say, living for Christ is the best life you can ever have, and it always includes suffering. You just cannot escape it. But most of us just don't think that way. We tend to be surprised when trials come and how those trials come about and even where they come from. We're not, we're not prepared for those things, it seems. We're convinced that, in fact, we don't even deserve. We're better than that. We don't deserve to go through fiery trials. We convince ourselves of this. Hey, listen, those trials come to test us as believers. Did you know that? It's so true. The bottom line is there's a purpose in every trial. There's a purpose in every fiery trial you face. I love the way Chuck Swindoll put this. He said, if we view life as a schoolroom and God as the instructor, it should come as no surprise when we encounter pop quizzes and periodic examinations. Maturity in the Christian life is measured by our ability to withstand the tests that come our way without having them shake our foundations or throw us into an emotional tailspin. So there it is. Secondly, fiery trials have their reasons. You know, we love to ask the question, why, don't we? Most of the time, we honestly have no idea why, though, when we are going through a fiery trial, or at least not at first. Now, later on down the road, we may have that, what we call 20-20 hindsight, where we get it, but at the time, we don't see it. We can ask questions in search of a possible answer, and one of the questions you may need to ask is this, did I sin? Or do I have a sinful attitude in this situation? And if the answer to that is yes, then the, the obvious thing that must be done first is just to repent. Everybody say repent. That is a change of mind that results in a change of attitude and behavior in your life. You go a, a 180, you, you go a different direction from the way you have been going. And that's important. Repentance, if you have sin in your life or a sinful attitude, is vital. But what if it's not? What if the answer to that question is no, that there's not sin involved here, and no, I don't have a sinful attitude? Well, if that's the case, then yeah, I, you're just going to need to trust God that He will use this trial for, get this, His good purpose. That's right, His good purpose. Now, the first reason for a fiery trial for some people is to purify us. You see, that's what he's talking about over here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Listen again. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to, there is that word, try you in the King James. And it may, it may, it may be a word that says test you or purify you in your translation. 
But a fiery trial is really a furnace of persecution. That's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were at in Daniel chapter 3 in the Old Testament, isn't it? When they were refusing to bow down to the king and they say, you know, no matter what happens here, we're going to do what God told us to do. They were in the fiery trial of persecution. Of course, we know how that turned out. It turned out very well because God had that, just like he's got your situation. Over in Job, I think about all the fiery trials that Job went through. But in the 23rd chapter of Job, in verse 10, it says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth, get this, as gold. Isn't that great? Yes, God has a promise. Some trials are meant to correct us. Others are meant to deepen our walk with the Lord. And others are just meant to train us for future ministry opportunities that God has on the horizon for us. Someone once said that God hates sin so much and loves his children so much that he will spare us no pain. That's right. He will spare us no pain to rid us of that which he hates. Oh, friend, God hates anything that would mess up your growth and development as a believer. Brian Dirksen wrote a song back in the 1990s called Refiner's Fire. I love that song. Here are some of the words from that. Refiner's fire, my heart's desire, is to be holy. Set apart for you, Lord, I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart, cleanse me from within, and make me holy. Purify my heart, cleanse me from my sin, deep within. Refiner's fire, how true those words are. Friends, Jesus is my refiner, and I pray he's yours as well. The only thing that he will burn off of you is what the world puts on you. Remember that. And so that's a good thing. Now, the second reason for a fiery trial, when we think about the reasons or the whys for the fiery trials we experience, is found in verse 13 here in 1 Peter 4. It, it's simply this, to partner you with the Lord. Now you say, well, how do you get that out of verse 13? Listen carefully. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are, what's that next word? In the King James, it's the word partakers or partners or in partnership with, you see. Uh, he says, Part partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, said this, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So you see, that is a partnership, if you will, or his fellowship, as he says in verse 10, of those sufferings. When you and I go through a fiery trial for Jesus, remember this, you're getting into the fiery furnace with Jesus. It's a partnership, if you will. When people treat us the way they treated Christ, they are basically telling us without telling us, they don't even realize it, by the way, that, that uh, they see Jesus in you. Isn't that good? To see Jesus in, in, in me is an honor. It's a badge of courage. So we need to remember that. When we live for Christ, we will become a contrast to the ways of the world. People sometimes feel guilty uh, around us, not because of anything we say, but because of the life we're simply modeling for them, patterning for them, and living in front of them. That doesn't mean we're perfect. None of us is perfect. But when you're doing what you do for the Lord's honor and glory, somebody is going to learn something from it. And that's our goal. Instead of dealing with their sin, though, they would rather attack you. So when, you, when you're partnering with Jesus, you can expect a fiery trial from those who don't like what you're doing. The third reason for a fiery trial, when I think about those reasons, is to experience power. Let's move on down to verse 14 here in 1 Peter chapter 4. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So there it is, to experience power, it is so vitally important. How many of you have ever been whitewater rafting? 
You know, it's enjoyable to float down the river with a group of your friends or maybe relatives or what have you, but, but what do you remember most about the whitewater rafting trip? In most cases, it's not because you were with them on the, on the easy parts, no. It's the stressful time. It's the terrifying times when you were fighting with all your might to paddle through those rapids that were trying to flip your raft. That's what you remember, isn't it? You see, it's those fiery trials of our faith, those suffering times that we tend to remember most because that's what we get the most good out of in the long run. There's a sense of strength, confidence, and power that comes to us from overcoming the spiritual rapids of life. If we could talk to the saints of old, we would, we would discover quickly that their greatest spiritual moments came when they were in the fiery furnace of trials. I think about Abraham up on Mount Moriah when he was preparing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Do you remember that? I know that was a fiery trial for him. I think about Hosea who was learning to trust God through his wife's adultery. Oh, how horrible that had to have been for him. Paul, who said the thorn in the flesh that taught him that God's grace was sufficient over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All of those times are times of fiery furnace that must speak into our lives. You see, he talks about in the scripture, the spirit of glory and, and God resteth upon you. How important that is. Who is the spirit of glory? glory and who is the Spirit of God? Friends, it's the Holy Spirit. Do you want the power of God in your life? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 10, going to back, back to that thorn in the flesh that I mentioned that the Apostle Paul talked about, he said, therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, get this, then am I strong. That's great news. And that's good encouragement. Now the fourth reason as I think about the, the reasons uh, for fiery trials is this. And it comes from verse 16. It's to persuade others and glorify God. Listen. He says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. Let him what? Glorify God on this behalf. What will glorify the Lord and what will persuade others? You know, when you as a, a believer return good in exchange for evil, that will bring glory to God. When you love those who persecute you, that will bring glory to God. When you suffer without complaint or murmuring, that will glorify God and persuade others that the one that you're clinging to is the one that they need to cling to. The world is watching to see if what we have is real. Did you know that? In Acts chapter 16, verses 26 through 31, the, the setting there is Philippi. Paul and Silas are in jail, and there is a jailer. And about midnight, there came an earthquake. The Lord sent an earthquake. The, door, the jail cell doors flung open, and the jailer was asleep. And he came in, and he would have taken his own life because it, it, that would have been required of him if he would have lost those prisoners. But when they hollered out that we're not here, and they were singing and praising God, he came in and he said, Sirs, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? You see, they had gone through the fiery trials of fiery furnace, and he saw in them something he knew that he and his household needed. And so he turned to the Lord. And friends, that can happen in many other ways around us. Are you singing and praising God in spite of your fiery trials? So we don't always understand the reasons, but I can always assure you there is a reason. Thirdly and lastly, I want you to notice something else. Fiery trials cause responses. Now, for everything that ever happens, there's always a response on your part. I don't care what it is in your life, there's a response. And, and so the response here in verse 19 in 1 Peter 4 is this, that we should commit ourselves to the Lord. Listen to this. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit, notice that word commit, the keeping of their souls in him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, we should commit ourselves to the Lord. When a, when a person faces a trial, he will either pull back 
away from the Lord or he will move in closer to the Lord to cling to him. And I hope you're drawing nearer to him when you face those uh, problems. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, there's a man by the name of Demas, D-E-M-A-S. If you haven't read about him, you need to. And it says here in, for, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, a guy named Demas, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is a departed unto Thessalonica. But you see, on the other hand, you had the Apostle Paul, and, and he was maintaining his strong faith. He was growing closer to the Lord in his commitment to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 point that out, as well as 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, if you ever want to do a little more study in this. But it says that you, can, you, can, you cannot wait until the trial comes. You see, you need to learn to walk with the Lord now in the good times, in the easy times. That's when you need to walk with the Lord. That way you'll be more prepared when the tough times come and the fiery, uh, the fiery trials come up against you. Secondly, not only should we commit ourselves to the Lord, but another response that we as believers need to have is that we should not be ashamed. Listen to verse 16. It says this, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be a Shamed. That's right, don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. What, but, but what if they threaten you because of your faith? And he says, I don't care, don't be ashamed. I think, I think that this was very personal for Simon Peter. Do you remember what Simon Peter was doing on the night before Jesus was crucified? After he rebuked the Lord for even suggesting that he would not, that he would forsake him, it wasn't, it wasn't even the end of that evening before he on not one, not two, but three occasions denied the Lord. The rooster crowed and the, and the Lord Jesus told him that was going to happen. You see, in his flesh, he was not able to fight the fiery trial of faith. And so I believe when he wrote these words in verse 16, under the inspiration of God, let him not be ashamed. He was flashing back to that night before Christ was crucified and how much shame he had of Jesus. But oh, how he was transformed to have a new, stronger faith, right? I tell you what, we need to remember that, that, that the word ashamed means to dishonor. Don't do anything to dishonor the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, praise God that you are able to commit to Him and to be counted worthy to suffer through fiery trials for His honor and glory. And thirdly, uh, in a response to the fiery trials, we should Rejoice. Listen to verse 13 again in 1 Peter 4. But rejoice, that's how the verse starts, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So it's important that we do that. Even when you're overlooked for a promotion at work, even when you lose a friend because you disagree with their value system, even uh, when, when things don't go the way you expect, there's coming a day, friend, when God will give us a new body free from all trials, free from all persecution and suffering, and I can't wait for that to happen. But until then, how will we respond? Is God getting your attention through this passage of Scripture and this Bible study? It, has He shown you that you have a need to be saved because you've not yet placed your faith in Him? I urge you to come to Jesus. Today is a great day. I don't know of a better day to be saved than right here right now. And if you make that decision, that commitment, I want to pray for you in just a moment. But I hope when you get through praying, you'll pick up the phone. I don't care what time of night it is or day it is when you get this message and you make that commitment. I hope you'll pick up the phone and call 478-953-9509 and leave a message for Pastor Paul and say, I chose to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior today because I don't want to face another fiery trial in my life without Him in control by my side and all around me. How important that is. If you have a wrong attitude about trials, even as a believer, I hope that today will be a day of transforming your attitude. Give that to Jesus. Ask Him to help you. Have you isolated yourself from the Christian support of a church family as you're going through some tough times in your life? I've already today, I've already been on the phone with a number of folks who have been going through some real struggles in their lives and I was able to pray with them and help them as they were going through this, knowing that God has designed your trials for something stronger and better. Trust Him. Oh, how I ask you to do that. Let me pray for you right now.
Lord, may we be those people who slowly but surely learn to embrace our suffering. May we begin to understand, O oh Father, that it, 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 it truly is necessary uh, for us to do this if sin's grip on us is going to be loosened up. Lord, I pray that you would keep us focused on eternity. Empower us, Lord, to participate in ministry. Allow us to experience the glory of God when we obey you. And remind us, Lord, to entrust our souls to you because you're our creator. Father, I want to thank you that Jesus knew that the pain and suffering that he endured on the cross would be transformed into joy just three days later. Likewise, Lord, the struggles that, that believers are facing, uh, may we realize that our suffering uh, and the glory that will come eventually will be two, two sides of the same coin. Father, if we uh, have been imprinted by godly suffering, uh, help us to understand that we'll be transformed by eternal glory. May somebody today come to know you. May somebody ask you to help them through the fiery trials of their life. I pray all of this in the name that is above every name, the strong and sovereign name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us in our Bible study in 1 Peter. And I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I love you. I miss gathering with you in person, but we've had a wonderful time in our drive-through services for the drive-in services rather for the last two weeks, and the drive-through prayer time on the week before that. And we are marching towards June 21st for our very first Sunday back in the building in two different services at 8:30 and 11:30. So I hope you're marking your calendars and getting ready for that. We can't wait to see you in person. But in the meantime, I hope you, if you like this message, I hope you'll click the like button on YouTube or Facebook. And then I hope you'll also um, leave a comment for us and share that message with somebody. Thank you for your prayer support and your financial support of Friendship Baptist Church. There are five convenient ways for you to give in person, through the mail, on our church app, on our church website. And so whatever way you choose to give, I want you to know that we're grateful as you carry out God's kingdom's work in faithfully giving. God bless you, and have a great day in the Lord.